Excellent. Excellent. So the numbers will pop up here. We have a lot of people register for this, as you know, close to a thousand. So I bet we get three or 400, maybe even more. Steve, did you guys get lots of snow in Boston? You know, we didn't. We got maybe three or four inches. Um, west of the city got hit harder. Our kids, yeah. my, my sixth graders had two days of school off now, so. Yeah, so is they're, mine. My, quite, my, they're, they're quite thrilled about that. Yeah, yeah, my son's actually skiing right now at, the, at Greek Peak. And uh, nice. <laughs> when we were there last night, I, I was, I've been skiing three days in a row. Um, and I, I would have gone today except for this. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> And Fiona oh, looks great. like you're, like you're in, in the Bay Area, but you actually have sun, so that's unusual for this yeah. time. Yeah, it's, it's actually been pretty nice. Today it's raining, but, um, but generally speaking, it's been pretty nice. Can't okay. complain. Excellent. So we're up to almost 300 people. So we're going to give it another, another minute or two. Kind of move my chat box to the side so I can see it. I'm actually in the office day. I, I don't. I don't come to campus like almost never. I only come for for our webinars when we have or when we have another big event. And I don't want to risk my at home internet. <laughs> Should never be good. Yeah, so those, that's funny. We it's generally been pretty good. Verizon had a bit of an outage here a week ago, and I've gotten so spoiled to having it just be solid all the time that you know I was like, what the heck? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to give it another minute. So for those folks online, we're going to just wait one more minute. We had over a thousand people, I think, register. So I just want to make sure we have enough time for people to jump in. I'll start at 12.03, at least by, by, my, by my watch. I'm looking up. I see people from Budapest. What's that? Who's there? All right. Oh, Zoltan. I know Zoltan. Zoltan, thanks for joining us. All right. <clears throat> okay, I think we're going to jump in. So welcome everybody to our ongoing series of webinars. Um, welcome Steve, welcome Fiona in particular. Um, I'm Zach Schulman, class of 87, Law School 1990, as a lot of you know, and I currently direct the entrepreneurship program for Cornell, which is called Entrepreneurship at Cornell. Um, this is our monthly series. It's a partnership between EHC and the Cornell Entrepreneur Network, which we call CEN. Um, you can learn more about both of these programs uh, on links that we'll be putting in the chat now. Both are wonderful programs and uh, very, very active, particularly in the time of COVID. Um, so the goal of this ongoing series is to bring Cornell alumni, parents, and friends who are entrenched in entrepreneurship straight into your device, whether that be your phone or your computer, so you can hear our stories, get some good knowledge and ask questions. Um, in today's broadcast, we're really excited uh, to talk with uh, our alum, Steve Conine, class of 95. Uh, he was in Sperry, which was the same dorm I was in. Um, in I think it was Sperry, is that right, Steve? Were you, were you in Sperry? Yeah, that's right, yeah. that's okay. right. <laughs> um, I was in Sperry also back in from 83 to 87. Um, along with, uh, he was in uh, Sperry, along with his Cornell, fellow Cornell alum, Neeraj Shaw, who together they founded Wayfair. So today we have a very really unusual event with Steve is going to be moderating a chat with one of his senior executives, Fiona Tan. And Fiona is the head of Wayfair's global head of customer and supplier technology. And this should really be a fun conversation. So before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items as usual. Um, it'll be straight Q&A. Um, Steve will be asking questions of Fiona. We'll be going back and forth. A lot of you submitted questions in advance, which I've already gone through. And we'll also be taking additional questions via chat. I'm gonna ask that you do use the chat box for your Q&A. And when you do so, please select all panels and attendees so that everybody can see the questions. Obviously with this many people on a webinar, We'll be getting to relatively few of the questions. Please don't feel slighted, uh, but we only have about an hour. 
Um, today's session is being recorded, so you can watch it again later or share it with your friends. Uh, it'll take us a couple of days to get it posted up to our various sites. It's primarily on the CEN site and also the ESC uh, YouTube channel. So uh, with that said, let's get started and welcome both Steve and Fiona. I'm going to switch back to my camera so I can see. Excellent. So Steve, I'm going to let you jump right in. Um, I'm going to go off. I'm going to go off screen uh, just for a bit. Uh, Fiona, better turn your microphone on so he can hear you. Um, and uh, I'll jump back in with a question or two based on how you guys are doing. All right. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Zach. Um, it's good to know you got you have my back. And I'm very excited about this. I don't often get to interview people. Um, and I'm very excited to be interviewing Fiona today. Um, so I guess we'll, we'll jump, let's just jump right into it. So um, Fiona, I guess maybe we can start by having you introduce yourself. Um, you've been a, a leading tech teams at very well-known companies for 25 uh, years or more now. Um, and prior to Wayfair, you were um, leading uh, tech and engineering teams at Walmart. Um, so I guess give us an introduction and um, maybe love to you know, get into a little bit of, about why you pursued a career in tech. Yeah, sure. Um, so hi, everyone. Fiona Tan. I'm from uh, Malaysia, Penang. If uh, For those of you who know, it's a small island. I uh, lived in Singapore for a long time, and I came to the U.S. to go to college. Uh, and, and for me, uh, growing up, you know, where I grew up, you know, math and, math and science was sort of fairly well encouraged, and I was probably one of those kids that uh, would probably do yeah, a couple hundred math problems rather than write an English paper. So that was an area that I was um, always very enamored of. And when I came to the U.S. to go to college, I hadn't really thought about computer science specifically. I figured I wanted to do something in science um, and, and tech of, of some sort, but kind of fell into it and really loved like the puzzle solving optimization aspects of, of computer science. And, and I'm really grateful. I've, I've, my whole career has been, you could also say, fairly one track minded. <laughs> the whole career of mine has been in, in technology. Um, I've, I've been in different companies, but I've just, you know, really grateful. I found a field that I, that I love. Right. And I think Steve, you and I were chatting a little bit with, with tech and with CS in particular. I mean, you can apply it to so many different fields, right? So starting off, um, you know, I worked at Oracle and um, a company called Tipco building, you know, enterprise software, right? So it's mission critical applications, trying to help all these disparate applications and technologies integrate and talk to each other. And it's made CIOs very happy, but not so much great dinner conversation type topics, right? Then um, I think as I pivoted to uh, kind of big shift, right? Going to retail and e-commerce and more consumer tech, and then it became much more dinner conversation worthy. And, and we were just chatting about like my my family gives me probably the most feedback, you know, my mom and my my daughter particularly, because they're always shopping and they've always found something that, you know, can be improved on, right? So so that's the that's the interesting part about kind of the shift to to retail and and and, and commerce um, and online, right? So I think that's been been a fun switch for me. Yeah, retail is well, I, I've often I think from Mark Field joining our team that it's a fun category. Um, you know, I, I, this is maybe a fun way to put it, but death is really on the line, and uh, and so we can move quicker, and we can we can try things and, and experiment, innovate quickly, um, which I, I, it sounds whatever. You, you, you've obviously seen some of the other areas I, of I different categories. It. It's funny you mentioned that. I mean, I, I remember being on the phone with um, the CIO at McKesson, and. And we had an issue and she was telling me, you know, there are cancer drugs that we are trying to move in your shop. And I was like, oh my God, this is your <laughs> I mean, that it, it was, yeah, the, there are just different challenges, right? But, sure. but then too, it, there are differences that are, you have much longer release cycles, you know, quality control and all that is, is very different. Um, and, the, and in retail, it's very agile, but, and also consumers can be very fickle, right? So right. you do something and then you're going to have to pivot and, 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 and be ready for ideas, a lot of which are not going to necessarily stick. And you, you kind of have to have a bit of a thick skin and go, okay, well, that didn't work. Let's try something else, right? Yeah. Well, and so um, you, 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 uh, you sort of um, illustrated that early in your career, you, you knew you had an interest in math and science. And, and I think like a lot of people in, in engineering and entrepreneurs who are going into engineering, we start knowing how to do the craft and then, you know, over time um, evolve into leadership and take on more responsibility. Were there pivotal points in your career where you had a mentor or someone invested in you or you realized that, that leadership was really um, a, a path you wanted to head down? Yeah, I think um, the initial step into leadership uh, was 
it wasn't something I necessarily planned. It was more around my my leader, who who to this day is, is a mentor and, and, a, and a wonderful friend. But he kind of pushed me into it, kind of like you know, I think you're ready to lead a team. And in fact, here's you know, here's a team, right? Um, and and to some degree, you 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 do learn as you as you grow into it. Um, you know, in terms of leadership and, and a lot of and a lot of actually a lot of it is stuff we always talk about, right? Um, stuff you learn in kindergarten, right? Uh, you know, how do you share and how do you collaborate and be nice and, and, and you know, treat people the way people you want them to treat you. All, you know, a lot of that very basic things. Um, but, but then also, I think as you, as you go into leadership too, um, I think for me and, and, and some of this, maybe, maybe I'd be curious to hear your thoughts too, right? But it's just beyond your craft, right? It's just beyond just, um, coding and technology, it's, it's how do you lead and develop, but then it's also having an interest in sort of outside of your swim lane, right? So the business, the strategy, and, and that really helps you, I think, be a better technologist, a better leader of technologists. Um, and then hopefully your views uh, will help also sort of the business and, and, and the vision. And, and Steve, someone like you, who's, who's been, you know, obviously very ent entrepreneurial, right? And so you've obviously had to be outside of your swim lane and I, I'm, I'm you know, I'm curious to hear kind of a little bit about, about that from your, your perspective too. Yeah, um, no, I think you hit it. I mean, as an entrepreneur, you're a bit of a jack of all trades. I, it is interesting. And as I think we've evolved an engineering organization over the years and I've seen it grow and go through different cycles of, of time. Um, there are definitely people who are more wired to get energy out of managing. Um, and there are people who are more wired to get energy out of, out of I think, um, creation. And I think, you know, figuring out how you foster that in a team and how you identify that in people and those traits is important as you're cultivating a team and you're figuring out how to take full advantage of everyone's skills and, and you know, uh, and interests. Um, and I, and, and I've, I've seen that, you know, with my own self. There's times in my career where I get very energized by management. There's times where I get very energized by the act of creation. Um, and I think, you know, balancing that and figuring out that as you go through life is kind of an important part of the journey. And and, and it's certainly been an important part of my, my development as a, as a leader. I see Zach pop back up. Yeah, I, a... I have this question that, that keeps coming up um, and it was submitted before also. So you're talking about cultural and culture and leadership and things. How did Steve and Neeraj convince you to leave where you were to come to them? Because I mean, obviously we're doing great at, was at Walmart, right? I mean, yeah. you, you're, you're doing great there, a huge company. And now you're going to another relatively large company, but compared to Walmart, not a huge company. <laughs> right? um, how did they convince you to go? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, yeah. I mean, certainly, uh, so I was uh, leading Technology for the U.S. for Walmart, and and it was it was a very interesting role, very impactful. Um, you know, I still very feel very strongly about the company. I'm still a big Walmart customer. Um, you know, I think the thing that was really intriguing about Wayfair was sort of the kind of where where Wayfair is in the journey, and and uh, to some degree being able to to uh, to focus on a particular category and really being being a you know a leader in that one area. Right. I think the thing about Walmart, which was 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 very interesting in its own way was like we sold everything to everybody right so that's a different set of challenges you couldn't really say sell one thing really really well um you had to sell because you had to sell everything right so there were certainly aspects of that and also you know it was a large large company um and there is some amount of just being a large the large ship turning it was a, it was a little bit um slower i would say and so i was interested in, in being um, sort of the journey, kind of where the point was in journey with Wayfair and, and being able to accelerate and hopefully help the, the company sort of grow up um, was, was something I thought would be really interesting and fun to do. And and I'm a, I was a huge Wayfair customer. Part of it was I, I joke with Niraj, it's like, if you give me a discount on my purchases, <laughs> that would probably go a long way. Um, but yeah, I've always been, it, it was a, a company that I, you know, like I said, I've been a customer and really enjoyed the experience. And, and I was like, it'd be great to be able to do more for Wayfair than just help the top line, which I was already clearly doing, <laughs> right? And all the stuff I was buying and just helping the company. Yeah, so, so it sounds like uh, Steve and Neeraj's entrepreneurial energy was still there after oh, all this time. I mean, yeah. I think that's part of the culture that it's kind of neat. Um, you know, this, there's a thing around being manager doer, right? I, I, you know, Steve, I don't know when or, or when y'all sort of had that cultural element or when developed it, but I, I see that a lot at, at Wayfair, yeah. which is, which is kind of neat, right? I mean, Steve, you and Niraj are still very involved in a way that is, 
it engaging, but not, you know, necessarily micromanaging, right? So I think that's the, the fine balance, but it's, it's neat. And it's neat to be able to do that. I mean, that's the thing I wanted to do is I wanted to do more of that versus, you know, a lot of the other stuff right. that comes with the large business. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll pop back in. There's a lot of questions about Amazon, Steve, just a heads up. <laughs> you know, how to Fair compete, enough. all this, like, you know, so we'll have to, we'll have to get to that soon. Fair enough. Um, I, maybe Fiona, we could just jump into a little bit. So you're, you're the head of global or, or global head of customer service and supply technology. Um, maybe you could just talk for a minute about exactly what that is. Um, it's sort of the hidden part of e-commerce I always think of, and it's sort of the secret sauce is what happens after you click order or click, you know, place my order. So maybe you could talk for a minute just about that, your area. For sure, for sure. And I think part of it's been it, it kind of cool is I, I have sort of both parts of it, right? So you've got the customer experience. So that's the very visible part. So if you go to Wayfair.com and all our sites and the app, um, my team works on the experience. We want to make sure it's delightful. We want to make sure that um, the customers find everything that they're looking for and that they're happy with their purchases. So there's that aspect of it. And then there's the other part, which is kind of suppliers, right? How do we create a similar kind of experience for our suppliers that enables them to be as successful as possible on our platform. And, and then that kind of goes to the platform part of it, which is uh, we do want to think about ourselves more so as a platform. I think um, with a two-sided marketplace, obviously the customers, uh, but then also enabling our suppliers to be as successful as they can be. And we want to make sure that we're a strong partner in that in terms of building out that platform. And then there's the catalog, right? Which is to your point, that's the, you know, that's the innards of any kind of e-commerce, right? It's like what, you know, being able to find and, and being able to represent all the product and the content about the products that we're selling um, is, is that, that core catalog. And as we are growing, as we're looking at, hey, potentially new categories that we want to be in or new ways of selling, um, you know, new suppliers to bring in, that, that catalog piece is something that we need to really pivot on in terms of extensibility and scalability or new geos that we want to go to, right? So mm -hmm. from that perspective, it's, a, it's, it's neat because you've got, um, you know, some problems to solve from a customer experience. How do you make that great? From a supplier, how do you give them all the right data so they can be extremely successful in your platform? And then how do you ensure your platform can support all of that from an extensibility, scalability problem set? Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Well, Zach's back. No, for, yeah, Zach's back. We've got a lot of requests for Cornell alumni discount codes. I'll, I'll, I'll leave that up to you. I'm going to leave that up to you. You don't, you don't like have I should, to answer. I need like a flaming mem of some sort that can sort of like bring it, bring it across the screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll leave it up to you. Um, there's also a lot of questions just about digital advertising. You know, folks experiencing situations where they, they look for something on Wayfair and then like five, you know, five minutes later, the same item appears on their browser and Amazon for 20% less. Um, like that competitive issue would be great to talk about. Um, I don't know how, you, I, I'm not really sure how to frame the question, but I'm sure it's something you guys must think about all the time. Um, yeah, so there's, a, and there's a lot embedded in there, right? So th there's obviously the dynamic marketing side of this business, which we, we run a very complicated um, uh, tech stack for, for advertising and advertising bidding and, and targeted advertising. Um, and then there's a the competitive dynamic of how we think about where we sit in the ecosystem. Um, and how and why consumers pick us uh, over over you know at different competitors. Um, the uh, you know I think Fiona hit on a, a sort of one of the simplest probably parts of this, which is just that we're very focused on home. And so if you think about a lot of the mass merchant guys, so Walmart and Amazon would be very similar in a lot of ways. They kind of sell everything to everybody. Um, they've built machines that are good at that, and they're and every day they're making micro decisions to optimize around that. Um, we make micro decisions every day to optim um, optimize around a more focused problem in, in home in particular. And we happen to be in a category that has, you know, it has a very different dynamic than a lot of categories and consumer goods that, that, that people would shop. Um, Fiona, maybe I'd be, I'd be curious about your point of view on that. And, and a little bit of obviously, you know, Nears and I pitched you one story when, you, when, you're, when you're thinking about joining us. Now you're part of the organization. Are there things that you've seen that surprise you or, you know, that, that I, and I'd be curious both just from an overall like, standpoint, but also if you think about the competitive positioning and how you thought about us in the market vis-a-vis -vis Walmart or an Amazon, and then how, how, you know, how you think about us now that you're part of the team. Yeah, no, I think one of the things that um, maybe wasn't so surprising because we talked about it during the, the whole interview process, but I think um, as, as, as I was coming in and being part of it, right, the, the fact that, so with Amazon and, and, and Walmart, both, um, we, both those companies owned, you know, a good chunk of them, the, the, 
merchandise they were selling, right? So they were one piece sellers for, for a good amount of um, the, the catalog that they were selling. And then there was a marketplace and you kind of see if you're buying something, you know if it's you're buying from Walmart or you're buying from a third party marketplace. I think the, the, the interesting thing about um, Wayfair is how we bet, you know, how we essentially are a creepy marketplace, but if you look at our site, it's so highly curated. It's, it's um, we're really presenting a 1P experience and we stand behind it in a very 1P way. And so this, it's a, a really interesting way of um, doing business. And, and that again also goes back to, hey, look, how do, we, how do we treat our suppliers and how do we partner with them? Because honestly, we're trying to make them as successful as possible because that's how we, we make money, right? So essentially commissions and, 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 and you know, sort of the, uh, the, the profit around that. So if they're successful, we're successful, right? So I think there's a different set of challenges when you're doing that. Um, you know, I think for us, at, when, before when I was at Walmart, there's a whole bunch around, hey, look, you, you're acquiring a bunch of inventory, then you're trying to make bets around that. And then, you, you know, you have to clear it out. And, and there was a, a big machinery around um, clearance and, and making space for new for new inventory that you own in, in warehouse. And we don't really have similar sets of issues, but I think we, because we're so hyper-focused on this particular um, category, it's it's a much more browse. It takes a lot longer to, to, to um, to make a decision around buying, um, you know, the the experience of you know touching, feeling, et cetera, that you normally get in a physical store, you don't have online, but how do you how do you approximate that as best as possible? Right. I think those are mm -hmm. some of the interesting, really interesting challenges that we have in our area. Um, that you know, again, it's you know, Walmart and Amazon both sell in this category. It's just that they sell a whole bunch of other things as well. Right. So it was really hard to really focus and sort of put the amount of mind share in 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 home. Right. Um, but we can, right? Because that's that's our that's that's our focus area. Yeah, yeah, and I mean we're on an entrepreneurial um, whatever Cornell event here, so I'd be remiss if I didn't say, you know, I think you're hitting on this, but the supplier dynamic we have is we literally have tens of thousands of suppliers who are entrepreneurs, and you know they're they're scrappy, you know, hardworking individuals who have an idea, they've designed a product, they've figured out how to manufacture it or source it, or they. You know, they, 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 they all have a story behind what they're producing and our success really hinges on them being successful. And so, you know, we, we've, we've never had a dynamic with our supply chain, which I think a lot of traditional retailers have, which is kind of a, um, we beat you up on price. If you, if you, if your product's a top seller, we're going to figure out how to knock it off and, and take, you know, take you out of the equation and go direct or, you know, do, do it cheaper. Um, and we've, we've never done that. We've always had a dynamic where we really try to empower our suppliers. And, 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 and I know you mentioned it, a lot of the tools that you're working on are really trying to build out, you know, services and suites that, that make our suppliers successful. Um, and that dynamic, I, I think, you know, vis-a-vis -vis our competitors has, has stood us in good stead um, as, as we've built relationships with suppliers. Yeah, no, I think that's been definitely a, a very differentiating, I would say, point mm -hmm. about, about Wayfair and how we do business and therefore sort of how we, you know, our commitment and our relationship with suppliers and therefore what tooling we want to give them, what data we want to give them. And as they're growing in their, in their kind of evolution, you know, us also being able to support that. I think that's been, that's been super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. To the question of, of competition, it always is, uh, it's always frustrating because I feel like in retail, there's not like one thing any of us do that's like, oh, this is the one piece of secret sauce we have nobody else can do. We're all retailers. And, and so the experiences definitely um, overlap in a lot of ways, but at the end of the day, obviously, you're looking for customers to care enough to vote with their dollars and, and buy from you versus someone else. And, and it, it really, I think, is the compounding of a lot of the small stuff that adds up. Um, you know, I, I, I would just highlight it again. I think, I, I think the supply chain and the, and the operational side of retail is really where the rubber meets the road. You know, it's easy for any of us to throw up a website that promises everything's in stock and it all ships fast. It's very difficult to make that happen. Um, and that's really where I think a lot of the innovation particularly in the home category has taken place in our world and that we've um, built a differentiated experience from our competitors. So, um, you know, it's whatever, it's front and center of the stuff you focus on on a daily basis, but it's, um, it's really core to the experience. I guess maybe jumping back to just a different um, bit of questioning for a sec. So um, for careers, so obviously there's a lot of people on the, on the event here are probably thinking about their careers. Um, you know, do you have any advice for people who are just starting out their careers and are thinking about sort of the type of companies they'd like to work for, or as they think about different experiences in different companies that would maybe stand them in good stead over the careers? Um, love, love to hear any thoughts you have on that. Yeah, I, you know, I do think it, it's good to have an open mind as you're also looking at um, different areas that you could work in, right? I think there's, 
there are interesting things that you learn across um, different domains or even types of tech, right? I mentioned, you know, having been in enterprise software for a long time, you know, the, the kind of the focus on, in fact, in, in, in those worlds, they did not want you to be agile, right? Because every time you, you put a release out, it's going to probably invariably break something else within the system. So it was much longer release times, really high quality, making sure that there's a lot of integration testing, making sure everything is good. Um, but then, you know, and then if you're in something that's more in the consumer tech area, right? It's just learning how to be um, agile and quick and, 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 and being able to, to sort of hyper customer focused, right? Um, and, and learning from that. And then you've got other fields, healthcare, financial services, again, you know, obviously high impact, um, highly regulated. So, you, you know, there are other um, interesting things you learn and, and, and challenges that you deal with. So, you know, I, I, I do think, again, back to, you know, I'm a big fan, obviously, of, of technology and, and computer science and the things that you can do with it. I mean, that allows you to, to, to really flex into different fields, whether it's of your interest or where, whether you want to be challenged. And I, and I think in just want any of these areas, these are all things that you can build on and you can, you know, when I when I started at Walmart, that was I remember talking to Jeremy King, who was the CTO at that time, and he was hiring me. And I, you know, I wanted to remind him. I was like, you know, just so we're clear, you know, um, I I haven't done anything in retail or e-commerce or consumer, but I but I know how to shop, and I think I have a good talent for shopping. So if that's a if it's like good enough requirement, that was the thing. In a way, I mean, I, I was joking, but that kind of gives you that ability, right? When you're in tech, is that there are a lot of domains that you could go into and then especially for something that's kind of fun with retail is people understand it for the most part right it's not like you have to go take a class in it um and, and so it was it was it was kind of a fun um so yeah as you're looking at your career and also you know you don't have to you don't have to stay forever in one particular domain that's the beauty of also being able to switch around okay steve let me let me jump in with a couple of questions um, yeah. that seem to be pretty prevalent so I might get some of this wrong, so just bear with me, but is it easy for you to define what percent of your top line revenue ships directly from a, one of your suppliers to the customer as compared to well, from one of your warehouses to a customer? Uh, it is easy to define. I don't know how much we release, we release publicly. Okay. Um, and I forget what we've said, but, but a, at this point, the majority ships direct from our supply chain um, less than fifty percent ships from our warehouses, and I don't I don't know how much we've released publicly in terms of what that split is, but we obviously know it intimately internally. Yeah. And and, and, and I, I'm guessing that there's a goal toward more supplier direct shipping. Um, yeah, I would say there's a goal toward a blend. We we, we run a fairly significant um, logistics operation. Where, I should say a warehousing operation. So our suppliers, we really see them as being great at product design, QA, QC, manufacturing. From that point forward, we basically have try, are trying to build out services that let them then move product to the end consumer. So um, we do everything from Asian consolidation to ocean freight to drage within the country to line haul within the country to rebalance where freight is. We do warehousing services, and so we, we will we will um, our suppliers can buy warehouse services from us where they pay us to pick, pack, ship, store their products, um, and and then we do last mile. Obviously, we do you know small parcel all, all the way to large parcel. Um, I would say we we have been trying to grow our warehousing footprint to meet the demand that our suppliers have, and there's a lot who are increasingly using us to do those services because we can do them cheaper, we can run them at a higher efficiency than they can as individual uh, operators. Um, and so, you know, I don't I don't know that we'll ever get to where our our network or our our services um, are the dominant share, but I think they can continue to be a very meaningful share, and they're continuing to to take share of the overall. Uh, a number of products that we ship on a yearly basis. Okay, and and for stuff that's your own Wayfair brand, so you have a, you have multiple brands that are that are yours. Yeah. Is that does that follow the same model where you're obviously you most, you're not making your own goods, so um, where you you're getting it from a third party supplier, white labeling it. Yeah. So it, it, exactly. So um, we have talked about that publicly. Something and, and it, there's something like seventy percent of our of our the products we sell are are under our house brand. So they're they're white label products. Um, home is a really funny category because if you think about brand names, people would know. People would say, "Oh, Pottery Barn or Crate and Barrel or Restoration Hardware or." Um, you know, they, they, they name retailers. If you look under the scenes, the, those, those, those retailers are all buying from the same supply chain we're buying from. And they'll go to a big trade show and they'll cherry pick a rug from this vendor and a lamp from this vendor and a couch from this vendor, and, you know, wall art from this vendor. And they'll put it together into collections that, that, that go together. 
Um, and we did the exact same thing. And it's, it's, it's an easier construct for consumers to shop because if you love the urban industrial look uh, and mid price points, well, we can show you a zip code design and that'll, that'll be you know, a, a great collection for you to shop. And you don't have to go try to cherry pick and piece this stuff together. Um, and we benefit obviously because you love shopping our platform and it's hard to then find those products elsewhere on the internet. Now, you know, with enough hunting and digging and searching, you can probably find things that look very similar. Um, but a lot of times, you know, we've re-photographed or we've showed it in scenes with other products. And, and so, you know, if we've found that if consumers fall in love with products on our platform, um, we offer great price and we offer great, great value and selection and they tend to not go and put the effort in to then see if they can go save 5% by really shopping across the internet and looking for a discounter right. who might have that particular piece. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Fiona, what do you think about the idea, and maybe you've already experimented with this, so excuse me if you have, but with like really defined targeted marketing segments, for example, you know, dorm room package or man cave package or woman made woman cave package or I don't know young professional new apartment package like have you guys kind of targeted marketing in that way yeah I think we've done some of that I think it's it's always you know we're always trying to experiment and the nice thing is you know these are bundles that are sort of virtual right you can put them together and and put it out there and it's fairly well personalized so hopefully we can figure out who to show sort of the dorm room package to and and mm -hmm. Right. Um, that's, that's all part of trying to understand um, the customer, what they're shopping for, what they're interested in. And there's a lot of, you know, I think those of you out there that are really interested in sort of the science and, and machine learning, there's a lot of really interesting um, aspects around trying to figure out if, um, you know, what style is this particular thing in. And it's usually not even like completely like he hits 100%, whatever, right? It's like, it's a 70% this, 30% that. And it's a lot of the modeling, how do you get that right? So that you can kind of pattern match when somebody comes in and you know that, hey, they, they generally like to shop a certain way with uh, say, say modern or Scandinavian or whatever that you can actually show them the right thing. So there's there's a good amount of um, science in, in in all of that, right? Um, yeah. That's kind of the interesting parts of it. Well, it's interesting. A lot of the questions, and there's, by the way, there's so many questions I can't even keep up. Um, but, you know, in terms of staying ahead of Amazon, I mean, like offering these targeted segments mm -hmm. could be a way some people think about, you know, well, I want to buy a new room for my son or daughter who's going to Cornell. Here's how I do it. I just go to Wayfair and pop in where I am and then and, and they'll, they'll know I don't need an air conditioner, for example. Um, <laughs> you know, so it's just, it'll just be like dorm room, dorm room setup. So. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, I think we like to think about, uh, you know, there's a future world where every uh, address in the country will have a 3D model tied to it. And so, you know, what does that give us the ability to do? Well, like, you know, a crazy sort of vision that would be like, you can come on Wayfair, we could show you every product on the site in an image in your space, because you could render these things dynamically on the fly. And obviously, yeah. real time rendering is catching up to, you know, static rendering. But there's some really interesting things that, again, this is like, we are maniacally just focused on this category. So, you know, we're really thinking about and, and working on future solutions, you know, of that yep. kind of thing. And I, I should say a lot of people, a lot of folks, by the way, are just saying how much they love Wayfair. I so those, those aren't questions. I'm oh, just, that's great. I'm just offering some commentary. I think they're really just pushing for that alumni discount code <laughs> the truth, without, without saying it. Okay, keep uh, going. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay on screen, but I'm gonna search for another question. All right, maybe we could jump over to a, 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 a whatever, this is a little more, more timely, but um, Fiona, I'd love your thoughts. And we obviously talk about this a lot as a team, but like long-term effects on the dynamic the pandemic has caused, you know, all the virtual working from home and, and just, you know, the, the company culture. Do you have any, I'd be curious what your thoughts are, are on, on, on the dynamic and what, what you think will change. Yeah, no, for sure. I think certainly, you know, this is something that we all kind of went into without, you know, a lot of prep, right? So thinking about, you know, how would the work culture change and does remote work, does it work, right? And, and being able to still um, have the, capabilities of teaming and, 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 and building and whiteboarding. Whiteboarding is actually the, the thing that probably we, we still miss the most. And there's a bunch of whiteboarding tools out there, but it's not quite, it's not quite the same. Um, so, so I think it's, it's, it's the evolution of how we work, right? And, and I think we've been all probably pleasantly surprised at how much um, from a capacity um, and output perspective that, that we've been able to still keep up, if not in some ways be more efficient just from the not having to commute and all that nice stuff, mm -hmm. right? So, I think really it's going to be how do you find that right balance? Because I doubt that we'll go all the way back to <clears throat> to say how things were right in in, in say December of you know whatever um, twenty 
2020, was it? <laughs> <laughs> was it 19? I'll have it. I think it was 2020. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I think, you know, I think, I don't think we'll go all the way back. So I think it's how do you, how do you leverage all the good parts uh, that we learned, right? In terms of um, collaborating, uh, but, but still, I think also part of what, what helped too is, you know, when you have built those relationships, it, it's, it's a little bit easier to be able to work remotely um, because you, you kind of know how people think, but then over time, if that becomes the norm, you don't actually maybe have, you don't really know the people quite as well, right? You know, a new team and you've never met. I mean, I've, I mean, I actually joined during the pandemic, right? So I've only seen like this much of most people. I mean, see, we met before because right, right. the world was still um, a different place, but like my own team, I've only ever seen this much of, right? <laughs> and, and I remember one, somebody tell me, she's like, I'm five two. I'm like, I wouldn't have told, I wouldn't have known, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think there's some of that where you, you've got to weave that in, right? How do you how do you bring in all the, the, the great parts of being able to the conveniences of working remotely with the ability to still team and and, and build out the culture and the relationships that will allow us to continue to innovate and, and, and stay ahead. So yeah. Steve, the, the, there's an interesting pandemic question that just came in. <laughs> I'm literally just, it's, it's the almost yeah, go the last one. Is it, has the pandemic increased or decreased customer returns? Oh, interesting. Uh, it, it decreased them early on. And I think there's an element of like, I don't know, I guess we were all just kind of hoarding in the beginning. You were just <laughs> like, I got something, I better just keep it. Uh, and, and I guess probably the friction around returns was higher because, you know, you got to drive out to the post office or you got to whatever, drop it off somewhere. Um, I think that's moderated at this point. I, I haven't, I haven't really kept a close eye on it, um, but I, I, I haven't seen a, I haven't seen it really increase. Uh, it, you know, if anything, it, well, it definitely went down early on, and then yeah. I, you know, I think it's kind of moderated. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. I, I'm, I was just curious. And how about, how about this one? It says, you, "I'm just going to read it. It's just easier." So when you see me looking off. It's, I'm looking at my other screen. Yeah. Um, you clearly. You both clearly work hard in order to be successful in a competitive space, very competitive space. Um, how do you find ways to have fun at work? And do you think intentionally creating opportunities for fun at work is important to business success? Fiona, you wanna take the lead on that? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, I think there is definitely um, the, again, back to what I was saying around building relationships and, and sort of, you know, having that that culture that you know makes it fun. So it's we do spend a lot of time at work, um, and it'd be it it would be nicer, funner if we actually enjoyed what we're doing and enjoyed the people and knew a little bit about the people that we were working with and a little bit of how how different how to motivate each other, right? What what makes us tick? And and so and some of those things, you know, doing something fun is 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 helpful to, to sort of promote that. And so we do try to, and it's a little bit more challenging in, in, the, in the Zoom world, but um, you know, sometimes it's just making time to just, when I do have one-on-ones, for example, with my staff, it's just sometimes just, you know, spending some time just talking about not work related stuff, just to kind of get to know each other. Again, like I said, I have a disadvantage of just actually never having physically met a whole bunch of people. Um, yeah. so I think it, it's purposeful. I, I do, I mean, for me, I'm a big, um, relationship person from the point of view of like I, I do want to make sure that the team feels like a team and that we've got each other's back and all that and so I, I I think some of the fun stuff helps to, to draw that out um, yeah so so yeah. You, you just mentioned staff so I'm going to take advantage of that as a little segue um, Fiona when you're hiring someone for your direct staff can you name some of the top three either things you look for or things you don't look for yeah, I think a lot of it's around, um, you know, obviously there's, you want to make sure that there's a good fit from a technical competency standpoint, they've done, you know, the, the domain, et cetera. But then it's also a lot of how, how, how people get stuff done, right? And there are uh, different ways of doing it. And, and I think some that are, I, I do look for people who can, so I guess, let me take that back. I'm not looking for just everybody who looks the same. You, you want to make sure that there's good diversity and diversity of thought. But at the same time, for me, it's important that um, they're doing in, in ways that are respectful and 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 really, um, you know, trust. You know, that there's a whole that that you can build a, a culture that is trusting and um, transparent. And, mm -hmm. and so that's important to me too, right? As you're building out a team, is is clearly you want you want smart people, smarter people, hopefully, than you know, you hire somebody smarter than you, right? Because because that's that's going to help um, in terms of bringing up the across the board. But but it's also how 
how you get things done and what you think is important. Sorry, my kidney. Oh, there's your kidney. <laughs> <laughs> and like, and like, and like, like how much, how much, like if you, when you're hiring, like these are senior people, is it like, do you feel like, this is actually a question for me, by the way, I'm, I'm sure someone in the audience has it, but um, like, do you feel like, is there something that has to click intrinsically to say, yeah, this person is somebody that I can trust and I feel I can trust or, um, or do you, do you have some red flags that go up and say, you know, I, I just, I can't really figure out why, but I'm not quite comfortable. And then you just don't even make the decision to, to uh, hire. Yeah. I think we have to be careful there that, you know, we don't, we don't introduce kind of like personal bias into yeah, somebody. Yeah, or unconscious things. bias. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's the part that we have to be really careful about. And that's why also you don't have someone just hire people that, that thinks the same, right? You, you do want to have people that can push you. Um, so it's, it, I would say it's a balance. Um, and then, you know, and that's why also we usually have a, a pretty large interview panel. Um, yeah. So you, so you see, I'm hiring someone for my team. I have a panel across um, the, the board and, you know, depending on the seniority. I mean, I know Steve and Niraj help a lot in terms of interviewing as well. So we do, we do try to make sure that we want to make sure that it's a, a good cultural fit, but again, our, you know, again, you want to look for diversity of thought and, and, but, but still in a way that's going to be cohesive. Right. So yeah, it's, it's like a healthy tension, I guess I would say. I don't know, Steve. Yeah. If you yeah, no, it's, it's interesting, Zach, I, you know, I look back on our career and, and obviously there's a point in time where like, it was like, I'd meet someone and it was just me to make the decision. I'm like, do I hire this person or not? And there, I mean, you're going off of personal, I guess, history and kind of your sense of people. And, and you're, just take, you're taking risks on people, honestly. Like there's a bar you're looking for where they can converse and they seem honest and they seem, you know, hardworking and ambitious. And, um, and, and, there, and there's some risk you're taking on it. I think the trick with hiring is trying to figure out where do you, where do you have the right balance of that risk? And, you know, Fiona mentioned, but I think as we've gotten larger, um, having a, a diverse panel of people meeting every candidate has been probably the most powerful thing we can we've done mm -hmm. that actually has both improved the 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 it's 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 improved the risk profile of how we hire and it, it has let us basically um, have a higher certainty of the people we hire being people who will be successful in our organization and and you know it's it, we look at people across a whole bunch of different axes and um, Neeraj and I are doing probably the sort of you know culture fit sell sort of side of the interview panel a lot um, but you know it's I always love hearing oh how did they tech out or how did they do with the case or how did they you know um, you know, do, doing these different scenarios that, that we put put uh, interview candidates through, and and it's that picture that really gives you a much more, I think, accurate sense of okay, you know, will this person be, um, you know, a strong candidate in our environment? Will they and will they will they succeed in it? Because you're really looking for that crossover, right, where they're going to be successful and and, uh, and 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 you know and and do well in the organization. Um, yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, I know this was one of the questions, Steve, that you actually were going to ask, but someone else asked it also. So I'll just jump in if that's okay again. And this can go for both. This this goes. This question is for both of you, um, because I want to make it very, very clear. This is not a gender-based question whatsoever. Um, I'm going to say, say, say that right up front. So, how do you balance work with family commitments, especially given work from home during the pandemic, um, and also your career up to this point? And I can tell you. I mean, I'm working from home the whole time, and you know, my 15-year-old is there and um, I'm dealing with them all the time, but um, I'm just, it, it's, it's a great question for particularly yeah. very senior people like, like, like both of you. You know, you want to go first? You, you want me to go and you can think about it for a second? Go ahead. Um, so, um, you know, I guess part of me as an entrepreneur, I, I, I would say when we started Wayfair, I had pretty good clarity of how I wanted to sculpt my life over the next say 20 years. And, and I, and I knew family was an important part of that. And, and I, I was on a point in my life where I was getting old enough. I, I'd gotten married. I was, you know, I, I wanted to have a family and, um, and I guess from everything I've read and role models I've had in my own parents, I've sort of felt like it's, you know, prioritizing family is going to be important for me. So I, so I would say over the, over the period of running Wayfair, we've always been very respectful and thoughtful of that. And sort of when people have family events, they trump, pretty much everything else that that um, the business might be throwing at them, right? Um, the pandemic has actually been, on the one side, it's been a blessing because the amount of time I've spent with my family over the last year has just been something I, like I never thought I would have had the opportunity to have. And so I've spent more time with my teenage kids um, building and doing and, you know, interacting and having dinners and lunches than I ever thought I would, which has been, you know, super special. Um, 
you know, uh, on the flip side, we're all, we're just staring at a screen. So like, they're the only people I interact with. And so <laughs> there's the other side of like, all right, well, how healthy is that going to be? Um, but I, I think the, um, <coughs> If nothing else, I think the pandemic has probably has reinforced in our culture that the blend of family and work is very important, and that um, you know, like you can see Fiona's cat jumps up. Well, like you know, we're all in our environments. I don't know if you guys can hear my kids talking in the background earlier, but um, it's sort of it, it does it reinforces that like no responsible employees know how to balance that, and they can find the right balance, and they'll figure out what works for them in their environment. And we just we need to be respectful of that as their colleagues and as their partners going through the journey here of you know working together. Um, uh, those would be my, my, my two cents on it. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I no, I think a lot of that um, really resonates. I would also say, you know, I think from a point of view of a balance, right. And you know, I've been asked this question around, uh, you know, work, work life balance, et cetera. And, and I, and I think sometimes it's, it's, it's not always in balance work life at, at, at different stages. I think in different stages in your life, work might have, a, you know, you can pivot a little more towards work and in some other stages in your life, you might pivot more towards life, right? And family, um, more from an outsized proportion. And I think if I look back at my career, you know, when my kids were little, um, so I worked throughout, I, you know, I took a couple of months off when I, when I had the kids, but I, I, I chose to come back to work and, um, you know, had nannies and, but I didn't, for example, so I chose a position where I could still be productive, but I didn't have to travel as an example, right? But then as they got older, um, you know, I had more of the freedom and ability to take on positions that allowed me, that required me, let's just say, to, to do a lot more traveling, right? And, and so I think sometimes you make those, as you're looking at your career, I think, you know, you make those. And so, so sometimes people kind of go, it's not on, like on every day that you have to balance it every day. Um, I think it's just over time, you, you'll, you have to find that balance. Um, and, and yeah, I think that with the pandemic, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder sometimes to, to kind of, when does it bleed over? Because it's the same space that you're sitting in. Um, right now I'm in the dining room, right? So, so it's like, it sort of bleeds over where you work and where you don't work and you do other stuff. And sometimes I think you have to be a little more cognizant about, um, you know, not letting work sort of permeate all throughout. But having the kids around in a way <laughs> kind of helps also on the other side, make sure you realize because it, they're kind of in your face a lot more, right? Um, it's funny, I, I was supposed to have, I was supposed to have two, I was supposed to have an empty nest. My daughter had graduated from college and she was supposed to be be working, but now she's staying at home because she's remote. And then my my freshman in college was supposed to be in college, but he's also <laughs> home. It's been, been um, an interesting uh, turn of events, but it's, you know, it's also been, it's also been good because you do see some, it's also, you know, it, it, it's, I think again for us who are parents, right? It's like your, your kids get to see you a little bit in in a in a different way, right? Around hey, yeah. look, you actually they never really saw you at work, and now they actually see you at work and in action. And and mine are older, so we can actually have some conversations around hey, look, you know, this is kind of how I work. And my daughter, like, she's just started her first job, so you know, there's some interesting um, conversations we can have. And because we're sort of in sort of in the same space, right? You can kind of have some interesting so good learning for children kind of thing, right? <laughs> Just take advantage of everything it's gonna throw at you. Yeah, I actually think that's a, a really good point, um, not to make this personal, but you know, the fact that our kids, particularly our older ones that are like, my daughter's at McGill. I mean, she's in Canada, she can't get back. You know, she's had COVID, she can't get back. I mean, you know, it's like, she's fine by the way. Um, but it's like, like I'm like, I said to her the other day, like you've really been growing up, growing up a lot lately. Cause she's, you know, she's renting Airbnbs. She's dealing with medicine, she's dealing with, you know, university politics, or not politics, university administration all on her own, because we I can't do anything there. So um, it's in, I think it's really accelerated the rate at which older teenagers have had to grow up, um, which is probably, probably has some advantages, actually, um, even yeah. though, obviously, no one wants a pandemic ever. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch yeah. gears for a second, if that's okay. So yeah. a couple of comments have have commented on the incredible speed, this is probably more toward Fiona, of your customer response. So people say, yeah, I, 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 re I need to return an item. It, I guess mostly you guys have a don't return policy for the most part, uh, which I love. <laughs> I think people wanna hear about that, um, give to charity. Um, but how is the customer service so freaking fast? Like, and I, I've, I've experienced that myself, like literally, it takes only like one push to get a real person. So. And they happen to be a Wayfair employee, like, yeah. which is great. Um, yeah. Anyway, 
Yeah, I think that's that's another one of those differentiating factors. I think um, that that is very different Wayfair versus um, you know the, the Walmart's, Amazon's, and other retailers. I it, that really stood out, and and maybe Steve can talk a little bit about sort of why that was. You know, I I I think it was was it the the Q for all hands or whatever where you and Niraj were were working the the customer service line. So it's yeah. it's definitely a such an intrinsic part of company culture, which um which which is this this thing around service to the customer, right? And even if they are calling to to make a return, right? That you pick up the phone and and you have whether you know we're also looking at you know other avenues around chat because not everybody likes to pick up the phone. I personally <laughs> don't like to call anybody. So so, so also using tech to to help with um, different avenues in which we can provide service to the customer, but but yeah, I mean you hit it, you, you touched on something that I think is a very intrinsic part of the the company culture that is around customer service, right? Um, I know Steve, yeah. when did you all yeah. discuss? It's, it's really I, you know, I mean the quick, I would say the quick history. You know, we, we uh, yeah, it's always been an integral part of what we believed is a core um, skill we need to have as a company, and and. When we started Wafer in 02, a lot of internet companies didn't even offer phone service. And so we, we <laughs> realized early on in this category, we could really differentiate ourselves. And Neeraj and I worked the phones a lot for the first four or five years, taking customer service calls. And we do it occasionally still, but, um, which is, you know, customers are always funny when you're like, well, this is Steve Conan, one of the co-founders of Wayfair. I'm calling about your order. They don't, it just washes over them. They're just like, yeah, whatever. Like, uh, is my order going to get here? You know, is, and so <laughs> it, it is funny. On the return front, um, you know, we don't discourage returns. We've 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 invested a lot to make returns as friction, frictionless as we can, because um, it's it's a it's a it's a part of the shopping experience that people don't love. And obviously, you know, we try to make it easy. Um, you sort of reference it, but yeah, occasionally we will do just a like, um, you know, donate locally because it, it, it's you know get the nature of different products, the return shipping, and all this is sometimes that's kind of the warranted outcome. But um, but uh, yeah, we I mean we we prefer people don't return stuff we'd like them to be happy with their original purchase but we try to make it easy um across the same thing and i think customer service is interesting in that regard because as fiona referenced like a lot of times automated self-service can be preferable self-service and then you know but if you need to get someone on the phone we want to make sure that's quick and easy too so that you know any lane you pick um you you feel like you're serviced well great yeah. okay steve yeah, do you have another question there i can i can search for some more too I have, I mean, literally, there must be like 80 questions. So I'm like, <laughs> um, yeah, if you have something that you're seeing pop up a lot, uh, okay. feel free to throw it out. I guess well, I can tell you, I can tell you one that keeps popping up is like, what's yeah. your biggest competitive threat? And I know that because you're a public company, you, you might be constrained in some of these answers, but people really want to know how you see the competition. You know, like, what are you doing about it? Yeah, you know, it's we, retail is funny again because, like, look, I mean, look at the retail brands that you're like, why does that still exist? And they're just insanely durable, even when they are like mismanaged and not focused and not executing well. And we're focused and long term oriented and executing well. And so, if you look at how fast we're growing, the market share we're taking, we're really we're a big share taker. So, I guess the question would be, do you think you can, you know, someone's going to come along and you're going to be able to not take share as quickly as you are? Um, you know, we've got a lead at this point in a category that has never had anyone really consolidated the way we are. And we're like, you know, we think it's like a $800 billion category between the US and, and Europe. We're like, you know, 2% of that or less. And so it's like, we have just a tiny fraction of what the market opportunity is. And so I guess, you know, our biggest threat is our own um, ability to execute and our ability to continue to have a tight operation and have, you know, a tight culture inside the company. Um, I, I, I certainly there will be competitors and we won't be hundred percent of the market and there will be lots of options for where people can shop in the world. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I, I do think that, you know, that, that we've, whatever Amazon and Walmart have been big competitors of us early on. I mean, back in 02, we started this, I remember worrying about them and it's sort of like every year you become more and more of a legitimate threat to them. Um, and we're all obviously watching each other, but um, I think if we continue to have a strong team and, and have a long-term focus that we'll continue to, to have a huge opportunity ahead of us here. Yeah, I mean, Fiona, what's your view on, on your international expansion? Yeah, I mean, I think right now we are in a few countries in, you know, we obviously in Canada um, and then in, in Europe. And so we're looking at, and, and Steve can also talk through this more, but just looking at how do we, you know, continue to expand from a geo perspective, right? Which countries do we go to next? Um, and making sure, again, we have 
you know, from a supply chain perspective, how does that look um, from a experience perspective? You know, how do we do this in a, in a scalable, extensible way? Um, but yeah, we, that is certainly um, um, on the cards for us in terms of a geographic expansion of our business. Yeah, I mean, and I, I got to ask this other question because it, it relates to what you were just talking about. I mean, would you ever encourage somebody today to start a company like Wayfair, given all the crazy competition? So oddly, oddly enough, look, retail is a vast market. It's two thirds of GDP is consumer spending, right? So I can guarantee if you're an entrepreneur, you can go into retail and you can carve out a niche for yourself and you can, you can create a business that's meaningfully sized. Whether you want to go head to head against Wayfair day one, you'd be crazy to do that, right? But like, you got to start small and chip away. And 20 years from now, we might look around and be like, oh, we should have saw that. But I think for sure there's opportunity for entrepreneurs in retail and it, and, it, and there forever will be. I mean, it's just, it's such a vast market. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so Fiona, um, you've only been at Wayfair, what now for six months or not even? Not, not quite. Not quite. So, so, so this, this question might be difficult to answer because you don't have a lot of history there to um, go by, but what is your biggest challenge been? And, and try to keep it. I mean, obviously the pandemic's a challenge, but like besides the pandemic, what is your biggest challenge, Ben? Um, I, you know, I, I don't know if it would tip all the way to a challenge, but I, you know, I think a lot of it is again, um, you know, where the company is in terms of the growth and really pivoting a little bit, right? It's like, how do you take the best parts of the culture, the really agile, can-do attitude, um, but maybe take a step back and just figure out how do you build in a sustainable way? How do you build in an extensible way? Because we want to move fast. And that's a point where the way we used to the way, way we've been doing things um, is going to make it a little bit difficult for us to pivot and move fast, right? So, you know, it's like, how do you, if you want to go to a new country, um, do you want to do it in a more, maybe you take the time to do it with, with the right platforms, with the right um, thoughts around how do you design the catalog to build the support, et cetera. So I think it's it's been that. It's not, like I said, it's not, doesn't probably fall into the area of a challenge. I think it's just more around how do you pivot and now you're going to probably flex different muscles or they're going to be important as we as we move fast and it's really because we've been so successful so it's really because of all the good work that's been done thus far mm -hmm. and then how do you tweak it a little bit because you're gonna i think we're gonna accelerate you know up into the right it's like it's like keeping a hold of the freight train <laughs> like hold on um, yeah. um another we only have a few minutes left but another topic that's really been quite popular in the in the chat box is sustainability and environmental issues um you know, I got the, the other day, I got a package, not from Wayfair, but it, it, someone sent me a single bottle of wine. And I, I swear to God, the, um, the, the box was, was this big and it had three different cardboard things in there to keep things from getting broken. Um, how does Wayfair address sustainability environmental issues? Because obviously you're contributing to this, uh, to this issue through all the shipments. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's interesting because I, I think, um, one thing with shopping online is that it does put front and center how much packaging is involved in in retail. And historically, I worked in retail as a kid, and you know uh, the packaging was removed out back and thrown in a big uh, cardboard dumpster, so consumers never saw it. Um, I don't know that e-commerce has added much to the overall packaging equation, and and a lot of the products we ship, we try to ship as densely as we can and in the original packaging. And um, there are certainly scenarios where, like you described with the wine thing, I, you know, I, you see, you're like, okay, that's like egregious. We shouldn't be doing that. Um, and those are all things we build into the system. We're going through as a company, um, a, a big energy audit right now and trying to really understand where we can have impact um, in, in sustainability. And for sure, our supply chain is one side of it. Um, um, you know, you could imagine, I mean, the, the tens of thousands of entrepreneurs we have that sell products on our platform, a lot of them have amazing uh, sustainability stories behind their products and it's stuff they care deeply about and it's why they've designed or created certain products that we sell. We need to get better at telling their stories and creating consistency across the industry so consumers can understand the products they're buying, what the sustainability uh, is behind it. Mm -hmm. um, we, we are in the early, I guess, innings of creating that vocabulary and creating the systems to do that, but, but we have a team that's focused on it and we're really excited about the impact we can have across the industry because we think by you know, shining a light on it, it, it will help consumers make better decisions and it'll help um, create better um, outcomes in, in, in sustainability in, in the industry. Right. Yeah. You know, do you want to add to that? I mean, when you're dealing with the whole supply chain, is it an issue that, that you can mandate from suppliers? 
I think, you know, I think if we are working with them, um, there are advantages we can give them. So for example, if they were going to be more sustainable and there was say a badge that we have now got for folks that meet a certain threshold around sustainability is like, you know, making that prevalent or making that visible to our customers so they can make decisions. So, so I think there are things that we can help them with, right? In terms of, hey, we, we think that this is, you know, this is an area that our customers are really interested in. Um, if you can improve in this area and, and, and we can surface that to our customers, right? I think for them, it'll be net positive. And so it's an issue that I think we need to work with carefully, um, but, but also just, just really bring that up with our, with our supply base. And then how do you surface that up to the customers so that they can also help make decisions, yeah. right? Interesting. Okay, one more question. I'm gonna start with Fiona and then Steve, if you wanna chime in, feel free. So a couple of people have asked about Ikea because we haven't, no, no one's, Ikea hasn't come out of your mouth yet. I don't think once. Um, so is Ikea a threat? Is it Ikea just, I mean, how do you view Ikea? Yeah, Ikea's model is a little bit different. If you, if you look at, you know, Wayfair, Amazon, Walmart, Ikea's uh, model is, is a little bit different. And, and we probably do have some crossover in terms of people that buy things on Ikea versus, versus Wayfair. Um, I don't know. I don't know, Steve, if we think about it as more or less of a threat than some of the other retailers. Um, they just have a, you know, they have a different way of doing business. Um, a little With bit different. big stores and things. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's interesting, Zach. I actually visited an Ikea like two months ago. I hadn't been to one in a while. And, and, um, and Ikea does a phenomenal job servicing the entry level price points in the market, but they require the customer to be the delivery agent. So you have to go to the Ikea, see it, walk around the warehouse and back, pick it off the shelves, drag it out, put it in your car. If you're willing to do that, it is an amazing value. And, and I think it's a very durable part of the market that they sit in as a result of that. If Ikea has to actually, you know, put it in a box and hand it to UPS and have it taken to your home, all of a sudden they're in the price points that we hit. And so the products they've done, they just, they value engineered that whole system to be very focused on how do you just really get high efficiency when the consumer has, um, usually it's an episodic event in their lives. They've moved to a new city and they go to an Ikea and they fill up their car, or their van full of, you know, a, a full set of rooms or whatever, and they drive it home. Um, that's an experience that I think they own. And they well, do I mean, it's interesting, company. Steve, because you, you mentioned that you can go into retail and then with a yeah. specific niche and that's, that, that's what they are. I mean, you just defined it. You right, and they, yeah, they struggle with online because they, they yeah. can't have pricing parity with the store because it's too expensive to ship. And yeah, but that's, yeah. That's yeah, the online thing doesn't work because I mean, they want you to go to the store, right? Just from the way the price points right. are. You know, Walmart. But it's a good niche. Yeah, it's a big <laughs> niche. It's a big niche. <laughs> it's a big niche. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Well, listen, it's one o'clock, so we're going to have to shut things um, off. But I want just a couple quick closing remarks um, and then we will um, uh, part our ways, unfortunately. And by the way, when, when the webinar ends, it just ends all of a sudden. Um, because once the Zoom link gets shut off, it gets shut off everybody. So we, we like to give notice of that abrupt ending. Um, so again, today the um, event was recorded. Um, it's, it will be available on the CEN live stream and also on the ESC YouTube channel. Those links will show up in the chat in just a second. Um, we'll be announcing our next webinar soon. Um, hopefully it will be in March. Uh, we have a couple of potential speakers for that one already. And a quick public service announcement um, because there's a lot of alumni on the phone. Um, it is time to make your voice heard by voting in the Cornell Alumni Trustee election. Uh, Cornell is one of the few major universities that offer its alumni an opportunity to vote for an alumni board member, actually two of them. Um, and by voting, you obviously are helping select members of the Cornell University Board of Trustees who guide literally the future of our alma mater. Um, the link is in the chat to uh, meet the candidates and to vote as soon as you can, hopefully today. Okay, so Fiona and Steve, thank you so much. This has been absolutely wonderful. I always enjoy conversations like this and I really, really appreciate you taking the time. Um, and for the folks on the webinar, uh, keep dreaming big, make things happen. Enjoy the snow. I could show you a picture of Ithaca today. We got a lot last night and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks a lot. <laughs>